Thanks so much. Um, Blaine, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, uh, my wife, Avis, would like to dispute one thing. The most reasonable man in America. <laughs> she's, not, you know, she's, she's not hearing of that. Um, <clears throat> but I do want to thank uh, everyone, uh, everyone in Louisville, especially everyone here at the university, for this wonderful welcome, um, for the opportunity to, to speak tonight, and also uh, for giving me an entire day off from my um, somewhat dysfunctional MSNBC family, which, is, uh, which can get kind of interesting at times. Um, uh, so there was no morning Joe this morning. I didn't have to argue with Joe Scarborough. <laughs> and uh, um, I'll, be, I'll be off this evening as well. Uh, I want to talk about disintegration and the splintering of black America. And I guess I'd, I'd like to start really by explaining the genesis of the book uh, and the genesis of the thesis, it really arose um, from one of those nagging feelings that we get. Uh, I just had the nagging feeling that to the extent that we talk about black America at all, uh, that we were talking about uh, an illusion. We we're talking uh, in, in terms that were archaic. Uh, we we're talking about a black America that no longer existed. Um, we were having what uh, in Latin America they would have, would have called a dialogo de sordos, a, a dialogue of the death. Uh, because we were talking about black America as if it were a unitary thing about which you could generalize. And that just seemed to me empirically not true. It seemed uh, very difficult to, to generalize about uh, nearly 40 million people. Uh, Black America was never a monolith, but it seemed to me increasingly diverse uh, economically, in terms of education, in terms of how and where we lived. Uh, it, it just didn't make sense. Yet, number one, there was very little talk about black America at all. Uh, but number two, to the extent that we did talk about it, I thought the conversation seriously missed the mark. It was a conversation that still assumed that uh, you could talk about black leaders uh, or uh, black spokesmen or spokeswomen as if uh, any one person to claim leadership or to claim to read the minds of 40 million people. So I started looking at some research and seeing what had been done in the field and kind of testing out this thesis. Uh, and I began to think, well, maybe there's something here. Maybe this could be a book. Uh, then in Early 2007, two things happened that, uh, uh, that were very important to the development of this thesis and ultimately to the, to the book itself. Uh, the Pew Research Center, which does some marvelous research, uh, did a poll, a nationwide poll of African Americans. Uh, and they had all sorts of interesting findings in, in, the, in the day of a very large sample. Really, first-rate research, uh, but buried down in, in there was one finding that I just thought was amazing, and it was that 37 percent of African American respondents believed that Black Americans could no longer be thought of as a single race. Now, I have no idea what that meant. I just didn't, I, did, what is, I still don't know exactly what that means. But I knew mean, that's got to be something. That's almost four out of ten people, and no longer be thought of as a single race. That's weird. Um, uh, so there must be something there. Uh, the second thing that happened was uh, that a group of uh, African American publishers and publishing executives from the black press nationwide. Uh, this group was having a meeting in Washington, and so the Washington Post invited the group to come by for a reception. 
And I was asked to come down and greet the group, and it was about 30 or 35 people, perhaps, that came over. Uh, and so I said, sure, I'd be, I'd be delighted to, and I plan to do uh, what I would call a five-minute drive-by, basically. I was going to go down, say hello, and welcome to the Washington Post, have a great time here in Washington, you know, see you later. Uh, but I found the, the, the group really kind of engaging, and I started, I threw out this Pew statistic, and I, and I just started talking about this question of whether, when we talked about Black America, we were really having a, a conversation that made any sense. And the response was electric. Um, people started shooting back uh, observations and, uh, uh, and, and turning the question around, and somebody said, you know, yeah, well, you know, what about the immigrants? There are a lot of black, black immigrants coming, and that's, that adds to the mix. And, and people talked about obvious economic disparities that were um, uh, to them becoming more, more evident. I ended up spending the better part of an hour uh, with this group just shooting ideas back and forth. And at the end of that session, I said to myself, well, this is definitely a book. I don't know if, if, if I can pull it off, but there's something here. So I got serious about the research and really dug in and started working on a book proposal and, and talked to my publisher and we decided kind of what we wanted to do. And then another thing happened in 2007. This uh, junior senator from Illinois <laughs> <laughs> named Barack Obama, whom I had interviewed in his Senate office, and he explained how he was going to be the next president, and I was, you know, kind of, yeah, right, well, you know what, he was doing pretty well. Um, the Obama candidacy, uh, by the time I was figuring out what I thought the book was going to be, what I thought the book was going to be, the Obama candidacy was gathering steam, and it was becoming clear uh, that this was a possibility. Now, that little voice in the back of my head was saying, nah, nah, nah this, 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 this can't happen. But he was a serious candidate. And as it went on, I realized that there was just no way I could write this book without knowing how the Obama story came out. So, uh, so I informed uh, my editor and my agent that we were going to have to put the book on hold until we got to, uh, to election night, uh, which was a fascinating year. On uh, election night 2008, uh, I was with my dysfunctional MSNBC family. <laughs> Uh, and if you, I don't know how much, uh, whether you recall, but it was at a point where it was really dysfunctional because um, uh, Chris Matthews and Keith Olbermann um, uh, were the two sort of alpha males at uh, MSNBC. They were not getting along. There could be only one. And uh, so we had, um, we had survived the Democratic Convention when I thought they might actually come to blows on the set. Uh, but uh, there was still a little tension on election night, but that soon receded into the background because it became clear very early in the evening that this was history, uh, that we were witnessing history. And at uh, a moment I will never forget, 